Hi, friends and neighbors. I'm Carl Swenson, of course, mentor in uh, diversity, inclusion, and exceptionality, NIC1. And we're here today to talk about uh, individuals with emotional behavioral disorders and a behavioral intervention plan. So we'll get right to it. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about um, is just what are emotional and behavioral disorders. Um, there are many, many, many different uh, definitions out um, in the field. And as a result, we kind of got to lay it in um, and come up with something that we can work with. First of all, I want you to take a look at this slide. This slide indicates what the federal definition of uh, emotional disturbance is. This is the one that, um, that we see in... Um, we see in federal law, we also see this in the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, for Disorders, which is uh, called the DSM-4. Um, it really is the, um, uh, the professional's uh, version of how to determine certain disabilities. So we see here that um, uh, the, the keys to this, uh, one or more characteristics over a long period of time that adversely affect a child's educational performance. So we look at uh, some of the, uh, the specifics here. Um, inability to learn, not explained by other factors. So here we have a, 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 um, a category, if you will, of EBD, emotional behavioral disorders, that um, doesn't serve as a catch-all, but if, uh, if a child is not um, categorized in another category of disability, then oftentimes we'll find that person uh, categorized in EBD. Inability to, to have interpersonal peer relationships. Can't get along with anybody or can't make friends with anybody. This is a um, very common thing in EBD. Inappropriate behavior. Um, a behavior uh, inappropriate to the age and uh, to the situation um, is what we're looking at here. And then um, the last two um, have to do with internalized uh, behaviors, uh, pervasive mood of depression or unhappiness. The kid is always that way. It seems hard to get them out of the out of the uh, uh, the funk that they're in, the fog that they're in. And then finally, a uh, tendency to develop fears uh, of sim and physical symptoms. Um, so, as we continue in our definition here. Um, most of the definitions that we find, no matter where they are, have some very common uh, pieces to them. We always look at the frequency of occurrence or, or the rate of occurrence. We always look at the, the intensity of the behavior, the duration of the behavior, and the age appropriateness of the behavior. We tend to look, too, at um, behaviors that are either disturbing to us or uh, disturbed uh, uh, in the, uh, in light of the, uh, the student we're looking at. Um, transient nature of problematic behavior, does it happen in one place or does it happen in several? And then uh, uh, variation in cultural and social standards. Uh, do we have someone who's kind of outside of, of what we normally would consider as uh, appropriate behavior? So I mentioned that we use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, these are the, uh, these, these, I'm sorry, this is where we find the actual criteria uh, that uh, a professional would use in order to make a determination uh, toward EBD. Um, the bottom half of it um, talks about uh, how we look at internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Oftentimes we look at externalized behaviors as acting out or uh, uh, aggressive behavior or something like that. The internalized behaviors uh, are, as I mentioned before, uh, depression, uh, very moody, uh, developing um, um, you know, unrational fears and um, sometimes even medical symptoms. We do find that we have somewhat of a problem with diversity in the area of EBD, and that's because basically we have two ways to make this determination. We can use the, uh, the di uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 
which uh, professionals use to uh, follow a, a set list of criteria in order to make this uh, this diagnosis of a, of a uh, disability. Or we can use um, uh, some judgmental factors. Um, and oftentimes it's those judgmental factors that uh, cause us to see these problems with diversity. Uh, when I'm talking about a judgmental factor, we're looking at a disability here that um, is one of those that's invisible. We can't really tell by looking at a person uh, whether or not that person has an emotional or behavioral disorder. But there are uh, some judgments that a teacher can make uh, that may uh, indicate that uh, a child is indeed uh, qualified for EBD or characterized as EBD. And some of those have to do with acting out or, or behaviorally related or might have to do with uh, some things the teacher has seen in the past with particular children and, and this student um, is seems to be following that path. So um, that's where we get into the judgmental part of the, uh, of the uh, characterization. And we tend to see that there's a a larger number of African-American males um, in our EBD category uh, than would be expected. Um, as you're well aware, the, uh, the uh, African-American population represents about 16% of the total population in the United States. So just using um, uh, just using uh, common sense, we'd think that, well, okay, if, if the African Americans represent about 16% uh, of the population in the United States, then it would follow that uh, they would represent about 16% of the kids in uh, a category of EBD. Uh, but the, unfortunately, that's not true. Um, African American males represent about 35% of the uh, population in EBD. Um, so there's that overrepresentation, almost twice as twice the number that we would expect, well actually over twice the number that we would expect uh, has been identified with EBD. Um, and then also we see that females are underrepresented in this category. Um, we think that that's mostly because um, uh, females have a tendency to internalize their behaviors, whereas males have a tendency to externalize their behaviors. This chart that I'm going to show you now lists some of the uh, uh, some explanations or definitions, if you will, of some of the more common uh, problematic areas that we see in EBD, in emotional behavioral disorders. Um, all of these um, uh, are well explained here, and I'm not going to spend time reading this to you, but I do want you to know that, uh, that these are areas that it's kind of important for you to look at when you're thinking about um, whether or not a child um, should be categorized as emotionally behaviorally disordered. Now, having done that, let's take a little bit of a look at uh, some of the history of the field and how we got to where we are. Uh, many, many years ago, um, even a hundred years ago or more, um, there was um, this relationship uh, developed by psychologists and, and the smart folks of that day. Um, and in this relationship, they were seeing a, a close tie uh, between an intellectual disability and insanity. Now, obviously, um, they weren't really correct in what they were seeing, but uh, at the time, it seemed like uh, uh, that that was the connection. And then that led into something that was called the mental hygiene movement in which we tried to, uh, to correct uh, the mental problems that people seemed to have. We tried to, uh, to clean them up, if you will. And we did this in a number of ways. And oftentimes it was, uh, um, uh, it was done by putting people in institutions or using some um, very rudimentary forms of, uh, of behavioral therapy that oftentimes didn't work. Well, most of the time it didn't work, but it was where we were going at the time. Uh, some of these uh, mental hygiene uh, antics that were done early on led into some really, really marked, uh, uh, marked 
um, uh, important and market research. Um, and it began to show that there was a disorder that had to do with emotions and behaviors. And of course that became a field of specialized study and allowed us to have some uh, conceptual models of what we might do with those folks um, and how we might work with them uh, so that we could educate them in, in the way that they, um, they have a right to be educated. And uh, so we've done a lot of talking. We, I guess we need to look at what the numbers are. Um, now these are a little bit old, they're about five years old, but uh, it, it gives us a pretty good indication of what we've, um, what we're beginning to see um, more and more of. And, and uh, this tells us that uh, pretty close to a half a million students are uh, receiving or were receiving in, in the school year 2008-2009, were receiving uh, special education services because they had a, a behavioral or, or uh, an emotional disturbance. Now, um, the fact that this is, is uh, the fifth largest category is, is a little bit misleading because as it says, it's the most under-identified disability category. We have many more kids who should be categorized this way, but we've not done that at this point. Now, there are some etiologies that um, we think uh, cause some of these emotional behavioral disorders. There are some biological risks. Um, some of that's genetic and some of it's biological. Um, the biological ones are, uh, uh, are things that could possibly be changed, um, that could be altered. Biological risks we really can't do much about. Uh, but the psychosocial risk factors we we really can do something about. Uh, we find that the majority of kids with EBD have some sort of these uh, environmental risk factors that you see listed down here. Either there's problems with the family, there's uh, the, the family has a very low socioeconomic status, they're uh, below the poverty line, uh, there's been some sort of, uh, of uh, abuse and maltreatment, uh, mom doesn't care too much about the kids, uh, there's not been a lot of prenatal and postnatal uh, medical care, and they don't eat well. And those things really do uh, uh, make a, a big difference uh, when we get to looking at this. Now, this is a slide that, um, I, this is another one of those that I just want you to know about. Um, this is important for you as a, uh, as a teacher candidate to be able to, uh, uh, to think about uh, these different kinds of maltreatment of children, so physical abuse, the neglect, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. Um, I want you to be able to uh, uh, at least have an inkling of an idea of what we're, um, what we're talking about here because uh, uh, you become one of the first lines of defense for this. Now, it's, it's time for us to talk about the characteristics that we see uh, with children uh, with emotional and behavioral disorders. Um, first of all, when we're talking about learning characteristics, the first thing I want you to understand is that these kids are, are typically of average intelligence. Um, they, are, uh, they fall somewhere between uh, an IQ of 70 and 130, with an IQ of 100 being the average. So, and 95% of our population falls between um, the, the IQ points of 70 and 130, and, and these kids fall there too. Um, they are all uh, of average or above average intelligence. Um, it's just that we have some problems uh, in school because of um, those things that you see here. A lot of times their emotional uh, disorder or their behavioral disorder will, will cause them uh, to have um, disciplinary problems in school and as a result uh, they tend not to go to school so much because of those disciplinary problems. They tend to fail. Um, they tend to drop out. Uh, the social characteristics that you see uh, in them is that they have a great deal of difficulty in, uh, in any sort of a social uh, interaction with other kids. They're uh, oftentimes very aggressive. Um, the externalizing and internalizing behaviors that we've talked about before. Um, 
in, in language and communications, we see that there are problems with pragmatics. They don't understand all the, uh, the rules of, uh, of speech. Um, they have problems with both receptive and expressive language, with both uh, hearing and speaking, um, and they have a very limited or inappropriate uh, use of language. So now you, you're thinking you got a kid who might fall into this category, so we have to think about how we're going to uh, do these assessments that are required by the formal uh, assessment process um, that you've studied before. So as we look at these things then, we can uh, first um, remember that the, uh, the assessment process starts with observation. Um, and that includes interviewing um, the student, uh, parents, other teachers. We want to look at uh, uh, school records to see if this is uh, possibly an ongoing thing or is this something that's uh, just beginning to crop up. There are rating scales that we can use. Um, we'll get those from our educational psychologists usually. And um, we want to make sure that we observe the student in multiple uh, multiple settings. We want to see them in, uh, in the classroom. Uh, we want to see them in, in multiple classrooms, as a matter of fact. We want to see them in, um, in uh, social settings, like in the lunchroom or uh, maybe on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the playground during recess. We also want to, um, if we can, see them in, in classes that they enjoy as well as classes that they don't enjoy. We want to see if, um, if these behaviors are transient or if they are uh, consistent across uh, different settings. Uh, it, very, very possible that we want to have some sort of a medical evaluation uh, and that might be with a, a child psychologist or a child psychiatrist. Um, and it might also be with a medical doctor to make sure that there aren't any physical problems that might be, uh, uh, might be leading or lending toward these uh, EBDs. Um, and then, of course, we have to do the, the, the normal testing, the IQ testing, uh, uh, the uh, criterion reference assessments, um, as well as the, uh, the norm reference assessments to make sure that uh, uh, we can take a look at the kids' uh, uh, abilities, uh, and academic abilities. And then we have uh, a couple of other things, um, the strength-based assessments and the FBA, the, the Functional Behavioral Assessment. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. Where we have these kids placed uh, in classrooms is kind of interesting. You see that uh, 37, over 37 percent of the kids um, are placed in uh, the general education classroom. Now another uh, almost 20 percent of those are pulled out for resources. Uh, or resource rooms or for uh, they're pulled out for specials. Um, then the, the percentages begin to go down. You see the uh, the 10 percent or 13 percent in, in a separate school. Um, uh, some school districts have um, have schools uh, specifically for um, children with um, um, aggressive emotional behaviors or aggressive behavior um, so that uh, other kids within the schools can be protected. Um, and then, of course, we have these last ones down here where we're, we're talking uh, really kind of uh, the, the two that you see near the top, uh, residential facility and homebound or hospital. Those are the most restrictive environments. Now, the, the purple part, the quarter uh, to the left side, represents the what we refer to as the uh, self-contained classroom. Um, where uh, kids with uh, moderate or severe disabilities are uh, are schooled together in a in a room separate from the rest of the school. So placement um, is um, you know well over sixty percent of the um, um, well over well yeah, let's see well sixty three percent almost two thirds of the placement is in the uh, the public school and. Um, is uh, in the in the uh, self-contained or the the general education classroom. There are some things that we can do to help kids, uh, um, and as we look at this list, uh, some of this stuff is going to seem to be pretty obvious to you, I'd think. Uh, when we're looking at uh, making some interventions for EBD students, we have to look a lot at the physical environment. 
uh, is the physical environment causing uh, some of their um, some of their aggressive uh, behavior? Is it causing some? Is it causing them to channel uh, some of their uh, hostility and their anger? So, what can we do about this? Well. Time management becomes very important. Uh, we find that with kids with EBD, um, if we uh, don't really keep them busy and occupied, they tend to uh, uh, they tend to have more outbursts. So, uh, man maintaining that time management, you know, keeping uh, keeping their their um, activity schedules full is is uh, it's very important. Uh, transition management. A lot of kids with UBD don't uh, don't take change well, so uh, it's good, you know, if we're if we're going to move from uh, uh, from one part of the school to another, it's good to uh, to prep them for that. You know, tell them, okay, you know, in, in ten minutes we're leaving and we're going to uh, this other part of the school. In five minutes we're uh, moving. Uh, start getting prepared in three minutes we're going to leave so make sure your stuff is put away so on and so forth uh, the transition management uh, is an important thing and uh, proximity and movement um, within the classroom we want to make sure that um, we don't invade each other's space you know there's this this thing called personal space that's really important and it's especially important uh, for someone with externalized behaviors um, Personal space is very important, and we want to watch how we're moving through the classroom, and that has to do with the next one, the classroom arrangement. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, our classroom sizes are increased um, almost on a yearly basis. We we think we're going to have a classroom of of 20, and we end up with 35. Um, we have to put more desks in the room. Things get to be tighter, and that has a a problem that creates a problem for this movement management thing where um, a, a child walking through uh, an aisle that uh, has desks on either side may actually um, it may be so narrow that they end up running into uh, desks or into kids and um, that's some you know it can set people off so we have to to uh, uh, kind of control our management or our movement management plan and we have to really look closely at how we're arranging the classroom so that we don't impede on anybody's personal space and also so that uh, we don't have any problems with uh, um, with other things that might occur because of that and then classroom ambience is you know just make sure the classroom is bright and is cheerful and is welcoming and warm interventions that we can use uh, academically um, as we look at our curriculum, we want to make sure that um, that um, it's challenging enough uh, so that uh, we can do what we wanted to do in the in the uh, the slide before where uh, we were talking about uh, time management. We want to make sure that the curriculum is uh, challenging enough that it does that. Instructional delivery is uh, oftentimes a really good way to in, engage students. You know, we don't want to always lecture. We won't, don't want to do what I'm doing and and all the time be the uh, the only person who's providing any input. Um, we want to uh, kind of change that up a little bit. The uh, mnemonic strategies have to do with uh, uh, something that uh, we want our, our EBD kids to be able to do and that's self-monitor. So we develop some mnemonic strategies for them so that uh, um, as they begin to realize that they're about to have some sort of an outburst, they can work with these mnemonic strategies and kind of uh, bring themselves back down to where they need to be. And this is uh, also true with the self-monitoring strategies. We tie those together. We want to do curriculum-based measurement um, to make sure that the kids are, are moving along with the um, with the curriculum in the way that they do need to and then if we need to do any enhancements with the content um, we can certainly look at things like universal design for learning and RTI um, uh, uh, response to intervention uh, to help us with those content enhancements and to provide additional time and and uh, resources when they're needed um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that there's um, a video there, and, and actually that's a hot link. If you click on the link, it'll take you directly to that uh, uh, to that the video on self-regulation strategies. They're kind of cool to watch, and it's kind of cool to see how these things work out. Now, 
uh, some behavioral uh, interventions that we can uh, uh, we can kind of put in place to help um, EBD kids uh, kind of work like this social skills training wow um, so how do we develop social skills training well there's a couple of ways and typically what we think of is is modeling the teacher models uh, the appropriate social skills and then um, we hope that the kids follow through and that's true but um, there are some other things you know video modeling is is a great way we we make videos at uh, um, uh, show a proper way to do something or a proper way to uh, to avoid an outburst and and uh, this is a model for the kids and yeah it's very good we can we can have the kids um, uh, queue up that uh, that little video and more normally these things are only like three or four minutes long you know just long enough that to, to remind the kid what the appropriate uh, uh, appropriate actions are um, interpersonal problem solving having kids work things out together and to develop really good strategies for doing that conflict resolution um, <laughs> stop the fight before it happens um, that's uh, an e it sounds like an easy thing to do but oftentimes it's not uh, provision of re related services this um, of course in involves the use of some of the other professionals from the school um, things like um, um, uh, the educational psychologist counselors uh, uh, behavioral specialists, um, bringing some of those folks in to help. And then, of course, crisis prevention and management programs. Each classroom should have some sort of a crisis prevention and management program. Uh, you need to know, you need to have practiced um, what you're going to do in certain uh, certain situations, especially if, uh, if aggressive outbursts begin to escalate past a point where you personally uh, feel comfortable in taking care of it. Um, and at the bottom of this slide, you'll see a link that will uh, uh, shows you a video about teaching social skills and and how that might work for you in the classroom. So we've been uh, talking about some of the interventions that we might use if um, if they're not really uh, uh, helping you a lot. Those um, interventions aren't helping you a lot. Maybe it's time to do a functional behavioral assessment. Um, now, usually when we talk about function, we're thinking of good things um, and how. Um, you, know, you know what causes something to happen um, and that's uh, really what we're looking at here um, functional behavioral assessment is sometimes called an ABC assessment because it's looking for three things it's looking for an antecedent the A behavior the B and of course C is the consequence uh, we're looking to find out uh, how those things follow in order with a with a functional behavioral assessment now uh, in looking at this we have to do some things um, uh, it's important to understand uh, these terms antecedent behavior and consequence uh, because that's a basis for this whole process and the antecedent is that thing that causes a specific uh, behavior to happen. So we have an antecedent, the antecedent takes place, and then the behavior follows. And the consequence is um, what the behavior causes. What's the outcome of this behavioral, uh, this behavioral outburst? Uh, uh, who is benefiting? From this, that's kind of what we're looking for with the uh, with the A, the antecedent, the B, the behavior, and the C, the consequence. So um, these are the things that we have to be able to see in order to uh, properly conduct an FBA. So we have to see that there's some sort. Of, yeah, obviously there's some sort of problem behavior, and it has to be observable. We have to be able to see what's happening. So then we have to uh, uh, we have to determine we have to determine some sort of baseline here. So um, we have to look at this and and, and see uh, just how um, often it happens and and how serious it is. And then we have to look at um, uh, the conditions under which it's happening. And remember we talked about transit and consistent behaviors. Um, maybe the, the behavior is only happening in, happening in Miss Smith's class, and it's not happening in Miss Jones' class or anybody else's. Just in Miss Smith's class, 
then we really need to look at the conditions there in Miss Smith's class to find out uh, what's going on here. And then we also want to look at any uh, any of the etiology that uh, that might have uh, caused this behavior to happen and see if we can change any of the etiology in order to help. Now there are certain times when an FBA is required uh, and these are those. Um, if we have a student who's already been identified um, as having special needs and he's already been placed in a category of, of, uh, of disability and then we have uh, that student um, uh, has some sort of uh, uh, behavior which results in, uh, in disciplinary action and those disciplinary actions are often more than just being sent to the office unless it's a consistent thing. Um, but um, if, it's, if it's serious enough that uh, uh, the visit to the principal's office may result in a suspension or uh, maybe a result in a visit to uh, in-school uh, detention or something like that, then, uh, then it's time for a behavioral assessment. I'm sorry, a functional behavioral assessment. Um, if we have not yet placed a kid in special education, then we might want to create a, a behavioral intervention plan. This uh, behavioral disciplinary plan, plan is often, off, oftentimes called a behavioral intervention plan. And uh, uh, we need to do an FBA in order to put that in place. And then uh, as a result of a manifest uh, manifestation determination, um, when um, the uh, uh, the behavior, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> when the behavior is uh, a result of, of the disabling condition, um, so if the outburst is because of the disability, um, then we need to do uh, an FBA in order to try to um, obviously extinguish that behavior by changing the antecedent. There are some other times when we should consider uh, the FBA. Um, and I'll let you read this because uh, I, I, I think that uh, we're probably beating a couple of these things to death, but um, I do want you to know that there are times and um, when it's absolutely required and there are times when, uh, uh, when it certainly should be considered. Um, the most important one here, uh, the two of them uh, are the first two, the behavior uh, that interferes with education or the education of others and uh, the aggressive, destructive, non-compliant, self-injurious, or dangerous behaviors. Anytime a kid is uh, um, is caught up in something like that, then uh, it really is a good idea to do an FBA. Now, how do we do it? Uh, okay, yeah, it's a formal process. The FBA is a formal process. We can't just uh, we can't just step into this thing. We have to plan for it and we have to do it correctly. So. Um, we're going to look um, more closely at, at one and two uh, than we are three and four, but um, uh, you know, so that we understand how to get into this thing. Because once we get into the FBA, a lot of times uh, uh, some of the school specialists will come in to, uh, to finish it up for us. But we have to measure, um, well, I'm sorry, first of all, we have to identify the behavior and um, then we have to uh, to measure it. So as we talk about step one here, identify the challenging behavior in concrete and observable terms. And then we need to identify two the instruments that are going to assist us. So as we think about this, there should be some, some specific questions that we want answered. Uh, like first, what is what are the antecedents for the challenging behavior? What is it that takes place that causes this behavior to happen? Because typically we're going to find that those behaviors or those antecedents are very similar, whether they're in one um, one setting or another. Oftentimes those antecedents are similar, so um, we need to find that out. And then we need to find out what what the consequences are of that behavior. What's the outcome on the other side of the behavior? How does that work? And then we usually find that it's, uh, it's the student that benefits in this behavior, the, the EBD student who, be, who benefits, because either that child gains something 
or they avoid something and that's the whole purpose in what we're doing here let's say that um, let's say that that little Jesse is sitting at a desk and uh, he's, uh, he's pretty much being a, a pretty good kid um, and um, um, little Amy walks up uh, near him um, and Jesse lashes out at her and, and, and screams at her and tells her to go away. So Amy goes away because she doesn't want to be involved in this. And so then little Jesse goes back to, uh, uh, to sitting quietly at his desk. So the antecedent to this is Amy's approaching. The behavior is that Jesse lashes out at Amy. And the consequence is that Jesse's again all by himself, which is what he wanted in the first place and what he was enjoying in the first place. Let me give you another example. I'm in your classroom, and you're uh, and you're telling us, okay, well, the class telling the class we have ten minutes left in class. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get your social studies book out, and I'd like you to read pages forty-three through forty-eight. And so everybody reaches into the desk and pulls out the social studies book and opens it to, to the right page. And I open my book to page 43 and then I slam it shut and I throw it on the floor. And you being a good teacher say, well, what's wrong, little Carl? Why, why are you doing that? And I sit there and don't answer you. And so finally you become somewhat frustrated and you say, little Carl, go down to the principal's office and talk with Miss Principal and, and, and see if we can't solve this. So, the antecedent. The antecedent was that you told me to read. And maybe I'm not a very good reader. And maybe I'm a very poor reader. So, my behavior because I don't want to read is to slam my book shut and throw it on the floor. And then when you talk to me, I don't answer you. The consequence is that I get sent to the principal's office, but my outcome is I didn't have to read. I avoided that thing that I didn't want to do. And you sent me to the, uh, to the office, which is probably just exactly what I wanted to happen. So what we need to do is we need to, um, uh, change the way that we do things. These are some of the uh, the problem behaviors that you might want to extinguish. And of course, um, in a school, this is a short list. This is <laughs> There are many more problem behaviors than this, but this is just kind of a, a short list. And you see that uh, mine is down there in the middle of, the, of the, uh, the first column, defying authority and maybe even destroying property by throwing my book on the floor. So uh, that's pretty much uh, was mine. And little Jesse's is right up there at the top, uh, being physically aggressive and... Uh, um, I think he's probably somewhere else on there. Yeah, over on the in the right column, he's yelling. So we want to uh, we really want to work at distinguishing, or I'm sorry, extinguishing um, these behaviors. Now, how do we define those um, those challenging behaviors in concrete and observable terms? Well, okay, student is aggressive, student is disruptive, student is hyperactive. We know that those are the problems, so if we write them out so that they are concrete and observable, these are the things that we're looking for. And when, I, when we say that they're concrete and observable, that it's very important because a very big part of this, uh, this uh, FBA uh, revolves around observation of the student in many settings. So it's important that the person who's doing the observation has these concrete and observable descriptions um, in order to, uh, uh, to be able to do those observations. So we make out these, uh, these concrete and, and, and uh, um, observable descriptions and then we're going to figure out a way of how we're going to, uh, uh, to measure this. And our questions to be answered in this step are these. What is the strength of the challenging behavior? When we're talking about strength, we're talking about the frequency, we're talking about the duration, and, you know, literally the strength. How strong is this outburst? Um, is it just, a, you know, just a weenie little outburst, you know, where uh, 
maybe we're uh, uh, just uh, uh, fidgeting in the desk or, you know, I don't want to do that and speaking under our breath or something like that. Or is it very strong where it's a, a very aggressive and out, outgoing external type of uh, behavior? Um, and then how does this behavior compare to his peers' behaviors? Um, and that's a, that's a pretty easy question to answer just by watching the class when you're doing the observations. And then how does it vary across settings or does it vary across settings? That's also a very important thing to know. So the way that we're going to, uh, uh, to uh, assess this is through direct observations. Um, we'll watch for a period of time and we'll see if these behaviors happen. And in, uh, in doing that, we have to be mindful that we're watching for, uh, that we don't know uh, necessarily what the antecedent is, so we have to be uh, paying attention so when the, the, the behavior actually begins, uh, the outburst begins, then we can, uh, we can think backward uh, to uh, try to figure out what that antecedent was. And the reason that we're, we're doing this uh, over a period of time and in different environments is to make sure that we see some continuity here in these, in these antecedents. We want to make sure that we know what we're, uh, uh, what we're doing. And then after we've gathered all of this information, then we've got to evaluate it. And in doing so, we're going to try to answer some questions. What patterns of antecedent events do we see that's connected with the, uh, with the behavior? Um, and what is the student gaining or avoiding? It's always the EBD student that benefits from these, uh, uh, from these outbursts. So uh, we've got to figure out what, he, uh, what he's gaining or avoiding. And then um, what can we do to extinguish that behavior? So we're looking at the antecedent events that, that bring on the behavior uh, and what, um, uh, what performance deficits or skills contribute to the challenging behavior. In my case, where I slammed the book shut and threw it on the floor, it was because my deficit is in reading. Uh, if I'm reading at two grade levels below uh, my, the present level, then uh, that certainly is going to contribute. Then finally, we get into step four, which is how are we going to uh, describe um, how this behavior is working? Um, this is, uh, these are some questions uh, as to what that uh, hypothesis should offer. Um, is a student engaging in the challenging behavior to gain and or to avoid something? If so, what is it that they're attempting to avoid or gain? Is a student engaging because of corresponding reinforcements? Is it something that you're doing as a result um, of the behavior that they're enjoying, like being sent out of the room? Um, is, is that what's happening? So, and then how are we going to go about changing this? What can we do to extinguish this behavior? Well, typically the thing that we need to do is to change the antecedent. Um, and what we might do in my case, if there's 10 minutes left to go in the class, maybe, uh, maybe what we should do in order to help, um, help me uh, learn to read better, maybe we do some out loud reading. You know, maybe we do some, uh, 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 have um, kids read paragraphs at a time and I can follow along and uh, I might be able to uh, uh, learn a little bit about associating words with sounds and things like that. And so maybe that will extinguish uh, the behavior by, uh, by removing the antecedent. And uh, that kind of takes us to the end of what we want to talk about today. It takes you through a... Uh, uh, a pretty long and involved um, discussion of kids who might be EBD in the classroom and some of what we can do about it. Um, appreciate your time and, and efforts. If you have questions, please get in touch with me personally. Um, my email address is karl.swenson at wgu.edu. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much for your time and, and your attention, and uh, good luck in NIC1.